what we now must do is we must now look into the theoretical underpinnings of the approach in a lot more detail. And the obvious place that we have to start is uh, here. Uh, this next segment um, I will call uh, what is money. But one of the points that we made is that one of the differences between the approach that we would suggest in the mainstream school, one of the approaches that we have in common with all of the heterodox schools is taking seriously money, endogenous money, credit creation, and, uh, and so forth. So historically, throughout all time, there have been two basic theories of money, a commodity theory of money, uh, where money is literally a commodity, obviously a precious metal such as gold or silver. Secondly, the credit or the claim theory of money, and clearly underlying the premise of the AMM is a credit or claim theory of money, where money is just an entry. Um, it could be a book entry. It could be a computer entry. It's just an entry in a ledger, literally a credit. Uh, that's the Schumpeter's expression, by the way, the credit or the claim theory of money. Now, if you pick up a textbook on money, there, the textbook functions of money are usually given as A, a unit of account. But in uh, neoclassical theory, that's not actually taken particularly, particularly seriously. Uh, the unit of account is a numeraire and so forth. It's not really a unit of account per se. It's literally a numeraire. You pick one commodity out of a bunch of other commodities um, to, uh, to, to be the unit of account. Um, this, the next one is given is medium of exchange. Well. When you're talking about exchange, immediately you seem you're back to barter. It's, it's like almost, in, and I say for spot exchange, exchange on the spot, it seems that money is something that just replaces barter. Instead of handing over another good for another good, you hand over money for another good, but it's on the spot. You can almost imagine you know, handing over the money and the other person uh, handing over the goods and, and the deal um, is done. And then finally, um, uh, what is given is money as a store of value. And it seems to imply, um, again, that you know, money, does money have intrinsic value? Is money something which is gold or silver? So the, the textbook discussions seem to imply an underlying commodity theory of money, even though the textbook authors must be aware that this no longer applies in the modern world. And I put that next statement, if it ever did. Of course, it never did. Now, the, cr the credit or claim theory of money, uh, much more sophisticated. Um, and I've quoted from two uh, scholars, uh, both of whom I respect, uh, did respect in the case of Sir John Hicks. Um, the Hicks market theory of money. Hicks said, money is what is paid for a discharge of debt when that debt itself has been paid in terms of money. So it's purely circular reference. Like if money is electronic impulses in a computer to pay off your debt, you have to cough up so many electronic impulses in a computer. Absolutely right, uh, from Sir John Hicks. His title was not right. Uh, he, he calls it a market theory of money. He should have called it a monetary theory of markets. Uh, my friend Jeff Ingham, uh, Cambridge University, um, wrote an excellent book, um, The Economic Sociologist, on the nature of money. And he um, elaborated, if you like, Hicks's comment by saying that all money is debt insofar as the issuers of that debt promise to accept their own money for any debt payment by any bearer of the money. And you can see we're, you know, advancing into Kansas City territory here, um, that, uh, um, where, uh, of course, the Kansas City argument is that for the state money to be money, they must accept their own money in payment of taxes. Um, Hicks, um, also in that book, uh, put forward um, uh, his view of what money is, and he didn't mention um, store of wealth at all. He mentioned just these two things. He said unit of account, you know, in the sense of an abstract standard of value, right, and means of payment. And I'm using the sort of philosophical counts as here. Um, what Hicks means by this is that whatever counts as payment uh, of one of these debts. Now, um, that leads to two questions. 
Are means of payment and medium of the exchange the same thing? Definitively not. And that's one of the key, um, you know, um, key differences between this theory and some of the other theories that we discussed um, earlier today. Um, the, uh, the means of payment is definitively uh, the, the cancelling of a debt. And notice that timing is completely flexible. You know, you could pay in advance, cash in advance, but again, contrary to the neoclassical models, cash in advance is not the only thing. You can also don't pay till 2015 or 2016, i.e. you can incur a debt and you can pay it later. And spot exchange is just seen as a special case. Money as a means of payment covers spot exchange, but it doesn't emphasize the exchange of goods and services. It emphasizes the paying of debts. What has happened to the store of value function? Well, I mean, obviously the money, uh, it would be a good thing in capitalism if there was a money which retained its value. Um, indeed, my real interest rate rule would ensure precisely that. Um, but the store of value function per se um, disappears. It seems that the most two important ones uh, are, um, in Hicks's terms, unit of account and, uh, and means of payment. Um, now, if we do have a credit or a debt theory of money, we're implicitly arguing that the characteristic form of money in capitalism is bank money, and that involves both sides of commercial bank uh, balance sheets. And in the modern banking context, I think we must just be clear, I put an embryonic commercial bank balance sheets there, that the deposit liabilities are what we mean as the money, the credit is on the other side, the asset side of the bank, bank balance sheet, uh, the loans and other instruments that they use to, uh, uh, that, that, that they can issue. So um, if we say there's credit creation, that means that the banks have extended loans, but it implies that there's money creation on the deposit side to exactly the same thing. And this is the key to endogenous money. This is the uh, idea that money is endogenous. Um, the second thing is why is there a hierarchy of money, which is a crucial um, feature of the operation of financial markets in the real world. We quote from Hicks again, if payments are made by the offsetting of debts and the debts are owing from different people, it cannot be taken for granted that all will be paid um, or all will be paid exactly as promised so the debts may well be of different quality. And so you get this hierarchy of debts, um, you know, from uh, base money, commercial bank money, all other promises uh, to pay because the debts are of, uh, of different quality. And using a very standard notation, um, this is like the top end of the pyramid, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so I just have a question, oh, thanks. I have a question just going back a little bit um, for um, the difference between a uh, medium of exchange and means of yeah. payment. Because even though you incur debt, you still buy goods for that, like with that debt. So I, don't, I still don't understand the difference between medium of exchange and means of payment because I think you still end up paying, paying for goods and services with the money that you're well, it, it, debts can be for other things as well. Like a medium of exchange implies that you're exchanging one thing for another. If you take out a debt, so that's money as well, isn't it? I mean, the, the, you know, the, you know in, it, the means of payment is all inclusive. It includes the medium of exchange as a special case. Then it's, if you incur a debt in form of money, what you hand over is money. The mean of payment, you could look at it as when like the firm take a debt, then they pay it for, for the workers, which is main theory with the circuit. Yes. And this is a mean of payment. It's not like exchange because you are paying the workers, then the workers will, will use it as a medium of exchange. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, good point. You see the difference. This is just a small example. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this is very conventional um, notation. Um, I'm using the symbol H to stand for the monetary base. Um, that equals to currency in the hand of the public plus bank reserves. The money supply is again currency in the hands of the public plus deposits in the commercial banks and obviously uh, defined as broadly as, um, as you need to in the uh, contemporary um, economy. 
Now, this symbol H dates back to the days of monetarism when the monetary base was called high-powered money. And it's not a good term. But I've kept H because um, what else am I going to have? Two M's. So, so I've kept uh, H because um, it's convenient to have a different symbol. And as you all know, the algebraic relationship um, between M and H is uh, known as the so-called money multiplier, um, uh, which depends on uh, the banking ratios, cash to deposit ratio and reserve to deposit ratio. But as I think most people realize now, there is actually no uh, reliable numerical relationship between H and M because in fact all of the monetary base, the money supply, the cash to deposit ratio, the reserve to deposit ratio, they're all endogenous variables. So the idea of the money multiplier simply um, doesn't work. Um, the way that banks keep in step, and I've used Keynes's phrase there, is not by restricting them uh, to loaning out other people's money. That's a favorite phrase of, uh, of the neoclassical school. But basically by adjusting their own deposit and lending rates when the central bank policy rate changes. I'm using this ge generic term central bank policy rate, um, you know, the overnight rate in Canada, federal funds rate in, in the United States. So um, uh, let uh, I sub zero be the nominal policy rate of the central bank. Let I sub D be the um, uh, uh, deposit rate of the commercial bank and I sub L the lending rate of the commercial bank. So the commercial deposit uh, bank rate is actually a markdown. Um, it wouldn't be a two for one rule, it would be a two for something rule. Um, it's actually a markdown from the policy rate, so we can write ID is equal to uh, coefficient M1 times I0. And so therefore, if M0 is the, the bank spread, the uh, rate, the, the uh, markup between commercial bank deposit and lending rates, then the nominal bank lending rate, IL, is equal to M sub zero plus M1 times I sub zero. So therefore, it's reasonable to argue that the central bank can influence commercial bank lending rates and thereby the nominal value of bank balance sheets by changing the policy rate, but it's not reasonable to argue that there's any direct uh, numerical relationship between the monetary base and the money supply as such. We then have to get into those issues that we were talking about, the hierarchy of money, and I won't take this very far. Um, obviously, why are the liabilities of the state central bank the monetary base of the system? Why are they reserves for the commercial banks? Here, I would take very seriously the point of view of uh, chartalism, um, which has morphed into modern money theory in recent years which argues that it's the ability of the state to levy taxes and its obligation to accept um, uh, payment in its own money, which is the key. And you're all familiar with uh, Randy Ray's book, um, Modern Money Theory, A Primer. Um, the, the, um, the deposit liabilities of some subset of financial inst institutions, uh, you might call them the member banks. In Canada, we would call them the direct clearers in this second tier, if you will, also count as money and com com comprise most of the actual money supply. And that's very much larger than the monetary base. And so why do commercial bank deposits count as money? Well, first of all, there is an, a convertibility promise. I mean, it's a strange kind of convertibility promise, one computer impulse into another computer impulse. And of course, you know, uh, the Kansas City School would argue far more importantly, the fact that the state will also accept tax payments drawn on these banks, um, uh, um, you know, in payment of taxes. All other promises to pay, you know, count lower in the hierarchy. You know, all other financial instruments, financial assets, and, and so forth. Um, now we move on to um, one of the advertised uh, points of this uh, course, some puzzles about money and finance. And uh, Frederick will have, um, will, will, you'll make them not puzzles <laughs> by, by, by the end of the day. Um, we, we, we talked here abstractly about medium of exchange, unit of account, and what is money. And we talked abstractly about um, um, 
the different economic theories, the methodologies of the different theories, the underlying assumptions of the different theories, I've come to the conclusion that one of the ways to understand these issues is not just by, by you know, making those definitions, but trying to see how they actually work out you know, in, in practice, in, in, um, in actual things. And I, we've got altogether three puzzles about money and finance, and I hope it makes the, these things clearer. The first one is um, an archaic one, actually, puzzle number one. Um, it's by the Cambridge economist De Dennis, Rob Dennis Robertson, writing in 1922, writing essentially on the velocity of circulation in money. And this illustrates, if you like, the neoclassical theory supremely well. Um, and I'll just read it. On Derby Day, the Derby is a horse race in England. It's held at Epsom Racecourse in June, and it goes on uh, to this day. Two men, Bob and Joe, um, sufficiently proletarian names, invested in a barrel of beer and set off to Epsom uh, with the intention of selling it at retail at the racecourse at six pence a pint. Um, the penny, the symbol D, was a penny that was in circulation in Britain at the time. It uh, originates from the Roman uh, denarius. Um, so now, um, so they're going to sell it for six pence a pint, uh, the proceeds to be shared um, equally between them. On the way, Bob, who had one three-penny bit, three-penny bit is a coin worth three pennies, um, began to feel a great thirst and drank a pint of the beer, paying Joe three pence as his share of the market price. A little later, Joe yielded to the same desire and uh, drank a pint of the beer, returning the three pence to uh, Bob. The day was hot, and, long, and before long, Bob was thirsty again. And so, a little later, was Joe. And you can see what's going to happen. When they arrived at Epsom, the three pence, the threepenny bit, was back in Bob's pocket, and each had discharged his, in full his debts to the other, um, but the beer was all gone. One single threepenny bit, or threepenny bit, as it used to be called, had performed a volume of transactions which would have required many shillings. The shilling is another coin that was uh, in circulation at the time, uh, worth 12 pennies. Um, if the beer had been sold to the public in accordance with the original intention. Uh, so what do we make of this? Um, because this illustrates, in a sense, all the issues that we've been arguing about up to now, like the premise of neoclassical economics, maximizing utility, um, uh, um, what is money, um, you know, what's the purpose of the exercise, and so on. I think it illustrates it in a very good way. Well, what is missing from this account of Dennis Robertson? Well, if you look at it from a purely business point of view, and here I agree with Frederick, look at it from a business point of view. Well, the whole episode is, um, seems and is disastrous. <laughs> you know, the entrepreneurs have literally drunk the profits, right? It's a classic case of the whole thing um, going wrong. But if you notice, um, Dennis Robertson doesn't even notice this. His point is to illustrate the uh, concept uh, of the velocity of circulation of money. You know, how many times the three pence bit can go round. In reality, um, the story demonstrates the utter emptiness, the complete emptiness of the velocity of circulation uh, content. And indeed, if we think of our neoclassical um, economics, there's actually nothing wrong at all with this situation. And Robertson doesn't think there's anything wrong with the situation. The beer has been produced and drunk, it's given utility and satisfaction. It does not matter to whom. There's been an optimal allocation of resources. Utility is maximized. But you can't take that to the bank, I'm afraid. And that's the critique of all of neoclassical economics. I mean, um, there's nothing wrong with this situation. The, the economy is working perfectly well. Just different people have drunk the beer. You know, well, it, it's false, simply. So it seems that the neoclassical theory of utility is not an accurate theory of capitalism. So that's one of the reasons why I was making those methodological points that I was. Um, 
the reason it's not an accurate theory um, of capitalism is that there is no mechanism within it for the realization of profits in monetary terms. Realization is um, um, a term that originally comes from Marx, but all it means is getting money actually in your hand, literally realizing the profits. By the way, there is also nothing amiss from that story uh, from the perspective of either Marxism or classical economists. Both Marxism and classical economics have a real theory of value, a labor theory of value. However, nobody's being exploited in this particular case, although certainly the entrepreneurs had the intention of making a profit. Um, and the idea of profit as exploitation does not work in these particular circumstances. So the takeaway uh, of this is that money profits, the ability to realize money profits, are much more important in reality. They're decisively important in reality than they are ever allowed to be in theory. Um, you know, the error of the Eurozone is to imagine that you can run a capitalist economy without a mechanism for the realization of profits. I um, flesh out the uh, transactions velocity of circulation um, the, uh, the, um, the transactions version of the quantity theory for this admittedly microeconomic example would be M times V is equal to P times T. Money times velocity is equal to price times transactions. So let's suppose there are 20 transactions, 20 pints of beer. The money supply is three, the three pence. The price level is given to us, it's six. And we've now said that T is equal to 20. So Robertson's point would be that the um, velocity of, um, uh, of, of circulation is equal to 40. And it could be anything you like. It could go up to any number. And that saves, if you like, neoclassical economics. OK. I hope we're now satisfied. <laughs> the next puzzle is Marx's monetary circuit. And this, you know, this is a kind of complicated version from Das Kapital, uh, 1867. And I use the notation M, C, C prime, M prime. Uh, the entrepreneurs um, start with a sum of money, um, uh, dollars, uh, M. They then buy some commodities, C, valued in Marxian terms, including raw materials plus labor time. They then engage in production using these commodities C to make is more. Now, here's the leading question. What do we mean by more uh, commodities? Well, we mean more, more valuable uh, um, commodities. So in some sense, then, C prime minus C is the real value added. So the entrepreneurs then sell the um, enhanced commodities uh, C prime for more money, M prime. And the difference M prime minus M is what we mean, mean by the realized money profit. And obviously, the, the C uh, minus C prime would be the surplus value in the Marxian terms. Anyway, this is a description of capitalism, according to Marx. And strangely, it's not too uh, dissimilar uh, to the views of uh, Weber uh, uh, Schumpeter, uh, Keynes, uh, you know, and others. What is missing from Marx's account? First, we would need to define real value, um, uh, uh, which is an old question in economics. And obviously, both Marxian and classical uh, economics define this by the labor theory of value. Neoclassical, mainstream, and Austrian economic, economics define it by utility. Um, more to the present point, though, um, with the great respect to the questions that were, were asked, uh, I mean, the, the, the point is that both Marxian theory and classical theory have a real theory of value. That's the fundamental point, okay? Um, and uh, um, the, the, uh, more to the present point, if the money supply is fixed, how can it be possible for M prime to be greater than uh, M? And that's a crucial question. Uh, neither Marx, nor the classical economists, nor neoclassical economists ever seem, to ask, uh, uh, ever seem to ask the question. But modern accountants do ask of it um, uh, of businesses every day. 
Um, note there's a similarity there to, uh, the, uh, uh, to the problem uh, in the Robertson story um, that, uh, um, you know, again, uh, there's a theory of value implicit in the Robertson story. There's a theory of value implicit in Marx. Um, in both cases, those theories of value are unable to be realized. And that, and that I do insist, is the, uh, is, the, is the crucial point. Now, it would still be possible for, uh, for some uh, firms to make profits while others make losses. This is the uh, usual meaning of uh, competition, but that's not the answer. Because if someone makes a profit, someone makes a loss with the money supply fixed, it's still impossible for firms on average in aggregate to be profitable. Um, the system as a whole cannot function on the basis of um, zero aggregate profit. Um, I would say for the simple reason that expectation of success in any particular business would be zero and hence no incentive to act. And so the answer to the question that I'm asking 